Okay, there we go. All right, so welcome everyone to the 4B technical elective session run by the ECE Society. Uh, I'm Ryan, my co-host is Manasi, and Hi, we, we currently have five panelists. Um, so uh, why don't you introduce yourselves? I guess I'll go first. Uh, so my name is Arnab. Uh, I'm class of 2021, electrical engineering. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking to you guys about EC48 and hopefully EC464 today. Uh, hi. hi, everyone. Uh, name is Kenjin. Uh, just, yeah, CE 2021. Um, doing grad school right now, also in Rio Waterloo in CS. Um, I'll be talking about 406 and 459. But yeah, nice to see everyone. I, I'm okay. I don't see your faces, but still. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris. I graduated in 2020, so right at the tail beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I took uh, 406, 423, and 459, so I'll be commenting on those. Congrats, this is your computer. Uh, I Four four four. Currently, McGrath students while we're doing electrical control stuff. Uh, Craig, could you say again? Uh, we didn't. You were very faint. Uh, are you are you there? Yeah, how's it sound now? Okay, that is much much uh, better, much better. Okay. Still can't figure out how to get these damn video calls to work. So I'm a graduate in 2020. Uh, right now I'm a grad student. I do electrical control stuff. Uh, and in fourth year, I took the relevant courses where you see 444 and 488. Uh, Nathaniel? Hey guys, um, I'm in a meeting again, so please forgive me if I am not paying attention fully, but I am a recent graduate from April 2021. I did CE. I took a lot of um, machine learning courses actually because I wanted to complete the AI option and it's something I'm really interested in, but currently I'm working at AWS as level one software developer engineer. So you can ask me about those AI courses or you can ask me about the, um, I tried the embedded courses like 455, which we won't talk about today, but you can message me about and other courses like 459, which we will talk about. So yeah, looking forward to telling you guys what I know. All right, thank you. And uh, I suppose we can begin. So here's the list of courses. So as you can see, uh, we have interlaced it, the uh, ones that uh, computer engineering students are interested in and electrical engineering students. Um, and uh, the link to the presentation is in the chat. So if you want to um, look at the slides uh, and not just the screen share, uh, you can feel free do that. So uh, the topics to be discussed perhaps for each course, um, course content, the courses leading up to the technical elective, so which courses would have been useful to have previously completed, uh, workload, organization, labs, assignments, um, and of course the application um, to the industry and maybe grad school, I don't know. Um, and of course, uh, you don't need to be constrained by these topics. Um, you can discuss whatever, as long as it's somewhat on topic for the for each course. Like as long as it's like related to the course, that's what I meant. So, 
Our first uh, course is ECE 406, Algorithm Design and Analysis. Um, so uh, last term uh, in the winter, it was taught by Mahesh Tripunatara. Um, take it away. I guess I can start off for a little bit. Um, so uh, first things first, um, it's not exactly the lead code course. <laughs> Uh, I think other panelists will agree with me on that. Um, you might go into it uh, expecting that, but um, it's a uh, much more math heavy than um, you would expect, I guess. Um, that said, though, I, I do want to point out something that um, if if uh, Prof T, well, okay, he, um, Professor Mahesh Tripathi-Nitera, uh, um, he asks his students to prefer to him as Prof T, but <laughs> if Prof T does um, teach again next winter, uh, personally, I, I, I find him a really good prof. Um, he like actually listens to students and I remember like the year first assignment was really rough um, and he actually kind of toned down the difficulty a little bit uh, for the, the, the following assignments while still you know making it hard enough so that we learn and in like I think even for assignment four or something um, there was a question that people were really struggling and uh, he actually left like a trail of hints that, that, that eventually led to the answer but like he didn't just give us the answer right away so we, we, we still learn in the process and I really enjoyed that. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll let the other panelists give their opinions first. Uh, I took this back in 2020 uh, and I found it was pretty pretty good course. It, it was kind of to me like a mix of 250 with 103, but at a higher level for sure. Uh, like you, you do learn a lot of the coding stuff, but you also have to talk about the math behind it and do some proofs regarding it. Um, I think I had five assignments throughout the term, kind of like how EC103 was done for us, which is you put them on a paper, you scan them and send them in, but also there was coding. I think it was all Python. Uh, it was a pretty good course. Uh, if you're good at coding, it could be a nice one. If you're already pretty top tier in coding interviews, you might get just the math aspect out of it. I had Stephen Smith, by the way, in uh, 2020, and he was a pretty good prof. I guess I'll, I'll jump in uh, since no one else wants to take it. Um, so yeah, the assignments for, for last term at least, um, so there were four for us. Uh, each one had about four to five questions. And one of the question is always a Python tree question. Um, and then the others are just proving or math or like, you know, induction or something. Um, I, I know induction is like PTSD for <laughs> many of us, but uh, yeah, that, that, that is something you'll get into as well. Uh, and it sort of becomes fun in my opinion, but, but um, because it's very application heavy and it's kind of cool to understand what actually goes on behind the code. Um, personally, I, I wasn't a huge likely coder. Um, so it was kind of useful for me to learn. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's kind of useful for me for me to, to learn both the code and um, and the non-code side of things. Uh, in terms of application, well, uh, just for context, so I'm I'm in PhD right now in Worldu for uh, CS for human computer interaction. So to be very honest, most of ECE doesn't really apply, but uh, that, that was a personal choice. Um, so yeah, um, I guess something else that I, I will point out though is that. Uh, uh, yeah, just, just as previously mentioned, um, that there is quite a bit of proofs going in. And uh, the, the coding really isn't that big of a part. Uh, although that's it, um, you will kind of see how, like the implications are, are, are still in, into the coding side of things, um, but yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'll chime in. I also took this course last term, um, even though I'm not a fourth year. Um, in terms of, uh, so, so somebody asked in the chat, does it help with coding interviews? And I would say um, marginally. So yeah, so you, you're, the, the, the math and the proof aspect is um, very emphasized with Professor Tripunatara. Um, so you don't really have, you, you don't, it's not, it's not leech code. Um, it's it's definitely math. Um, in, in I found it quite interesting actually. Like uh, you see, 
like in the course description, inherently hard and unsolvable problems. Um, at the end, there was the unit uh, with um, proving whether something is NP, it was like NP complete, NP hard, all of that stuff. Um, that was like a, a, I guess a meta view of the algorithms. Um, but if you're, if you, if you just want to, if you want this to get better at interviews, this is not the course. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I found it useful because I was not very well practiced in coding uh, interviews. So when we learned about greedy algorithms and all that stuff, I was able to more usefully apply it, but I probably could have just done some leak code or whatever and <laughs> came to the same. So yeah, mileage varies. Uh, so I see a question on when would you use 406 on a job? So, well, okay, I, I can't really answer it very well since I'm not in industry, but um, I can imagine, well, okay, not 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 job, but in interviews, like um, if you've ever experienced interviews that are harder, like they ask you, hey, prove that, you know, <laughs> prove that uh, the recurrence is like whatever, like O, whatever, like big O, um, you do get some of that math. I, I think you do actually learn some of that math in 250, but um, you, you, it gets deeper here, um, kind of understanding, like at, at the start, there was a lot of big O stuff. Like understanding like asymptotic behaviors of codes, um, and so that that might be somewhat relevant. But again, like for most for the most part, yeah, if you spend the same amount of time, um, doing just lead code instead of learning the math, you you will probably get more out of interviews. If I'm being honest, um, with this does, does four six require any additional math course as a math foundation? Uh, not quite sure. Um, I transferred into uh ECE uh, in two A from mechatronics, so I kind of missed out on like discrete math and stuff in first year uh, but I, I found it was hard like like as hard for me I think as, as everyone else um, so I, I don't think there's a direct correlation there yeah so in, in terms of the math you need um, ECE 250 the algorithms course that preps you like preps you for the like the algorithms you'll see in this course and then in terms of math, you only need like ECE 108. You just need to know how to do proofs. Um, it, it does kind of like, the, the course does kind of tie back into ECE 208. Um, but that's like a, huh, this is, I see the connection now rather than a prerequisite. Sorry, uh, Ryan, I think there, there was a, Oh, okay. Okay, you answered. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Actually, if you don't mind sharing, like, what what what, what was the course that uh, you wanted to take that needed four six as a prereq? Uh, CS four eighty and four eighty six. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Because I I took CS four eighty without having this course as prereq, but that's interesting. Okay. Oh, so I guess it's just four eighty six then. Okay, I see. Yeah, the, the equivalent CS course for this course is 341. I, I will say that in my uh, experience, um, I have taken courses that kind of skip all the prerequisite, but I, I'm not sure how the EC department determines that. I'll just put that cautionary note out there. And I, that has been a few years ago, so I'm not sure if it's still the same. Um, but yeah. Uh, so which CS course? So um, I took a CS four eighty in three B. I oh, know three A. Yeah, yeah. I took CS four eighty in three A, and then I took CS eight eighty nine in during my fifth co op. Uh, and then during two B, I took EC four fifty five. But but yeah, like all of them had prerequisites that I kind of had to skip. Um, but yeah, so CS four eighty, I I got it because of uh, the AI, AI option. Uh, just like Nathaniel, but I, I didn't actually graduate with it because I didn't complete it. Um, so that, that was that. I guess we can move on to the next course, which is ECE 444, Integrated Analog Electronics, um, previously taught by David Nairn. I think I'm the only one who took this. 
Uh, so 444 is basically, uh, it's exclusively low, like silicon transistor stuff. So it's like one unit of 242 turn into a whole class, uh, or I guess it's EC340 now. I don't know which ones you had. Um, so the lab parts are online uh, simulations with LTSpice. So they had um, simulating uh, analog amplifiers as well as there, I, th I think when I took it, there was a, a, a Python assignment where you were sort of simulating a digital analog digital converter sort of thing. Uh, it's an interesting course if you're interested in doing low level electronic stuff. It's, uh, you know, uh, op amp design uh, compensation. So a little bit of EC380 stuff for, uh, for uh, stabilizing the feedback networks, but it's very simple. Uh, so in like 242, there was feedback, but it was only DC stuff. So in this class, you actually look at frequency response for the feedback networks. Um, overall, I thought it was a fun course, not too difficult, not the easiest. I think that's about all I have to say about it. Um, do you do you build your own amplifier? In simulation. With, with transistors and stuff? Yep. So you learn how to, so you do a bit of uh, like a differential amplifiers and stuff in 242. Here you're doing the whole thing. So you learn how to, to do a more detailed uh, design of a real op amp with uh, input stages and uh, intermediate stages, and then how to design an efficient output stage. We'll talk about the different styles and pros and cons, uh, how to calculate the efficiency, uh, and then how to uh, compensate them properly. So there's a little bit of, of, of math involved, uh, like with any circuits. And of course, there are nonlinear circuits of the transistors, so they're a little bit trickier. But the whole thing is basically just like it, the course is sort of intended to be uh, op amps, except that Professor David Nair and his personal research uh, fascination is analog dish converters. So he sort of throws it in as well. So the bulk of the course is op amp design, uh, how to do it, how to compensate them. Uh, and then he also talks about some other useful things like voltage references. How do you make a temperature compensated thing? So you, you learn about how to take uh, the BJT equations, the fancier ones, which are dependent on temperature. Uh, so then the, the current theory with the transistors, not just f function the voltage, but also the current, the, the the temperature. So then you learn how to design circuits such that uh, the temperature effect of this transistor cancels out the effect of that transistor. So you get end up getting voltage references independent of temperature. And then he talks about the digital analog converters, which is his own special interest. Uh, so he's quite excited about that. Uh, so you learn how to, then you have uh, a combination of sort of digital and analog electronics to sample it and how to, uh, different ways to design uh, those converters. Uh, someone in the chat asked, um, this is a bit off topic, but what, what are inter, what are, electrical engineering interviews like? I could say a few things here. Um, so it, it's saying the electrical engineering interviews is kind of a broad term. You, it really depends on what industry you're trying to go towards. Like I have a bunch of friends who are uh, like electrical, but they're going uh, towards uh, like software jobs. So uh, to your question there, um, I'm gonna assume you're probably gonna have to grind lead code for something like that. But myself, um, I, I went towards construction and uh, uh, electrical design, like infrastructure work and things like that. So interviews are quite a bit different from say, if you wanted to talk about like hardware jobs or something like that. For the sort of hardware jobs that I was applying for in undergrad, because I'm a grad student now, so I don't have a real job. But so my exclusive my experience is just for co-op stuff and my summer job after graduating. Uh, things like the, well, I had one interview which was silly where the dude dumped out a box of electronics in front of me and had me label them. So I'd say this is a resistor, that's a transistor. They just literally a box of uh, discrete components from a breadboard. Uh, and things like just 
how to uh, get questions like draw me a differential amplifier with this gain uh, using op amps and sort of basic electronics like that. But I honestly, some people had different opinions, but I, in my interviews, there was seldom any technical stuff. I was here for my CE friends, they had all these crazy questions, but then the EE interviews were mostly uh, void of any technical questions. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with that as well. Like all the interviews that I've had, uh, generally there were uh, behavioral questions, how you'd like conduct yourself at work, that kind of stuff. Uh, the most it ever got technical was a probably asked me to solve like a really simple circuit from like uh, first year or something like that, uh, just with like an inductor and a capacitor, like just finding voltages. Uh, so pretty straightforward stuff, I would say from my experience. There's one interesting interview question I had once. It was a company who said that they would, if you had a company who printed it like a thousand PCBs, but found a problem with it, then they would go to this company and they would sort of rework the boards to find the simplest fix they can do to change the circuit board uh, to fix the problem. And so he drew me a circuit on the screen. It was just like you had a power applied to the board and then this, this two ICs boot up, but then uh, you have to in ensure that chip A boots up before chip B, otherwise there's problems. So a question is, how do you modify this board and the, do the, the least modification as possible to fix that? And so the answer was just put in an RC filter on the power line to, to uh, delay the, the enable rising up on, on chip B. So it makes chip A turn on, and then a couple of milliseconds later, chip B turns on. So that's a, a practical, interesting question. Very, very simple. But I'll, I know that the person before me didn't get it correct. So. OK, uh, I'd like to welcome Chi Ren as a panelist. I believe he is Computer Engineering 2021. Uh, Chi Ren, if you would like to introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just graduated from uh, Computer Engineering uh, last month. Um, so, so I'm currently working as uh, mobile engineering at Shopify and uh, I've been doing mainly mobile development and uh, bit of backend for my co-op. As for my 4VTE, I've taken the uh, programming for performance and the computer like networking too, the advanced course, basically the one you take after 358. So if you're interested in that, I could talk about that a little bit, but yeah, nice to meet you all. All right, and uh, I guess we can move on to our next course, which is ECE 459, Programming for Performance. Um, this is taught by Jeff Sarnett and Patrick Lamb. Uh, take it away. Wait, am I talking about this? Or? If, if uh, whoever wants to talk about it can talk about it. Um, I can go. Um, cool. I remember taking this course. This is probably my favorite course at UW. I really, really enjoyed it. I can't express how well this course was delivered in terms of giving a good amount of work, a fair amount of work. I really like early on, they gave you the labs and give you a whole month to finish them. You'd have support to finish it. And then afterwards, like you could be pretty proud of the, you could be really proud of the stuff that you made. Uh, it's not like it was just a bird course that you learned a lot. So uh, it's taught by Jeff Sarnett. You guys might've had him for 252, which is a really popular course. And in terms of how it was, I would say the labs were, so the labs were all individual, yes. And it was all in Rust. We were the first class to take it in Rust from C++. I wouldn't let that be discouraging. <laughs> I know many, many students didn't like Rust and many were like uh, repelled by the idea of it. And I would say most of them were went over, but still there were some people who had their qualms afterwards about it. 
Rust is a new language much like C++ in terms that it's really fast and really good, not like Python. Not to hate on Python. I love Python, but Python is slow for many reasons, right? Rust is very fast because it is uh, like C++ and it does memory management. But the unique thing about Rust is that it is has a very, very picky compiler. Like if you thought the C++ compiler is bad, the Rust one is much worse. It will complain and yell at you for everything and make sure that you follow not only normal memory management rules, but like its own specific rules. It introduces new concepts to ensure, make sure that you don't make any memory mistakes. And that honestly should be a plus to that language, not a negative. It's just learning how Rust does these things. So given that uh, you're, you're not afraid of Rust, the course instead, what it does is it has four class, four labs, really similar actually to ones you would have probably done in 252. But when you did them in 252, I don't know, we did them in C. And that was pretty tough. <laughs> C is like, it lets you do whatever, right? So you have to figure it out on your own. Rust is more about like listening to the compiler and making it work, right? It won't work until the compiler says it works. And when it works, it actually probably does work. There's less chance of it being bugs. And it's more about just writing the code that works. I think the labs were, um, you'll probably remember this again from 2B, but like, it's like message passing versus queues for like talking. And then the first one is, just trying to multi-thread on web requests, which will obviously make things faster on the web if you can do them in parallel. Then you had GPU, which is a pretty out there lab, I would say for the course, but I really loved and really enjoyed and thought it was very useful for uh, just in your knowledge, not so much for like, you're gonna be doing this when you go become a software developer, but it's very useful to know, you know, how to program a GPU and they, the course does a really good job of explaining, you know, use cases from video games on the PS5 to just uh, machine learning applications. And the lab actually is write a neural network or not write a neural, make the neural network work on the, on the uh, GPU. And it was written by one of our classmates who's very, very intelligent. So again, you know, it's a good, good lab. And finally, the last lab was uh, teaching how to use flame graphs, which is a really cool tool that I've never heard about before, but it will learn, teach you to appreciate uh, profiling tools that show you how the graphs can reveal things that you don't know and will definitely check your assumptions and correct them because if you're like me you will have made assumptions that are wrong and this course teaches you how to use tools to fix those assumptions and make significant processes progress towards making things faster that uh i remember the exam was worth quite a bit though in this and comparatively to the labs but the labs were an easy 100 i think mostly as long as like you just paid attention and you did all the work and then the only thing left to do well on is the lab, uh, is, is the exam. I would say Jeff is a really, really understanding prof. Like if the servers go down the day of the deadline, even though he gave you a month to do it, he'll still extend the deadline just to help you out. So he was an EC student too, if you didn't know. That's a pretty big plus. And I know you guys asked how much the labs take. I think the labs were again, really reasonable, uh, even especially compared to some other courses. So maybe I would say like five to six hours for a lab. Uh, that might include like reading up on the lab manual and reading up and like how to do it, and then actually coding for the last three or four hours. And yeah, again, very much recommend this course. You'll get a good grade in it if you just do all the work and pay attention. And Jeff is super funny and there's a lot of people taking this course, so they'll help you on PIs. Thanks. I think Nathaniel pretty much covered everything. <laughs> that was great. That was awesome. Um, I, I do want to add that. Uh, I do want to add that. Uh, yeah. Uh, both Jeff and Patrick are awesome people. To be honest. Um. So first and foremost, you have an awesome like, you have an awesome group of people supporting you through your learning, right? Um. And like the I just want to go back to the Rust thing. <laughs> um. Like well, okay, because you know I'm in grad school. I haven't touched coding in the last month because I've I've just been reading papers. So I'm not a huge coder. Um, it was very daunting to me because I, I wasn't even a huge like C++ or C coder before that. Um, but honestly, like at the, at, the, at, the, at the start, you'd be like, yo, I hate Rust compiler with all my heart. At the end, you kind of love the Rust compiler because once your code works, it works. Like there's no runtime, you know, unexpected debugging thing going on that will take up. Like, you know how the other labs, like sometimes when you use C or C++, like the code compiles and then you run and it doesn't work on the board and you have to debug for like 10 hours because you don't know what's happening um that almost doesn't happen at all uh on rust which is kind of sweet 
it's very consistent performance. Now, sometimes the server gets into very heavy load uh, and there's inconsistency because of that, because when you get multi-threading, you get a bunch of people on the same CPU or GPU, weird things happen. But uh, the, the code itself at least is, is, is very consistent and nice to work with. Um, also, like maybe I want to touch on the final. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think the final for our class was what, 50% or something? If I, don't, if I didn't get it wrong. Um, it, it was pretty high anyway, but uh, the finals was uh, one, one of the most intense finals I've ever had, but also one of the most fun and satisfying at the same time. Uh, and I, I suspect that they will change the format a little bit going to uh, like next year because of our feedback. Uh, but, but essentially the finals for us was, um, okay, first of all, it was with Ross. And then basically what it, what it was is that um, he released the, 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 the uh, final questions, right? And also the GitHub code at the same time and then you have like 24 hours to work on it <laughs> right um and so and so it was it always felt like a hackathon to be honest and like many of us burned like <laughs> burned the whole night working on it <laughs> i remember in the piazza someone was just like hey it's 4 a.m and i'm still stuck on this question haha <laughs> that was really funny um <laughs> i think a lot of us were like really really stressed out about it but at the same time like i think the marketing came out very fair uh at least, at least like like um from what i know like mark, marks marks were, were, were really like it, it was it was a fair marking like it wasn't like you know you got wrecked by the servers you got zero marks like it, it really isn't like that uh, and also for the assignments uh, for me yeah uh, i suck at coding i guess so <laughs> so it took me a bit longer than five to six hours <laughs> um, i would say about like eight to ten uh just because of me just being unfamiliar in general with everything uh but but still like like at least like, i i felt like i had fun doing it i think that was a big thing that that really drove me and especially like the, the satisfaction is is amazing like <laughs> like when you get to run an actual gpu and like you know, it it like it runs new rankings for real. Like it's pretty cool. But yeah, I'll let um, the other panelists talk as well. Well, I can say when I took this, um, I think every CE was in this course, along with a few more E's, and every every lecture, which is like eight thirties on Mondays and Fridays, not the ideal lectures. It's maybe seventy percent filled, and we were in the DC large lecture halls. Uh, it's a popular class for a reason. It was well taught, great concepts. Uh, obviously, I guess we, me in 2020 had different content than 2021, it seems. Uh, a lot of our content was devoted to how to do this stuff in C++ because there's a lot of extra extensions you need compared to Rust. So I will definitely say having tried to learn Rust a bit, Rust is more straightforward than you, <laughs> you gotta give it credit. It's very nice for that. Um, did you guys still have to learn the multi-threading tools in 2021, um, like Valgrind and stuff? There were a few lectures going through that, uh, but I think in Rust, like there, there wasn't anything fancy that you you can you need to add on. Yeah, because you don't need it in in Rust. In C plus plus, you need it, but in in that ones you don't. So. No. It's the nice stuff about Rust. It makes you actually think less in the end once you get around it. Um, yeah, our exam was taken online at the end because it was near the start of the pandemic. But he also said then that his exam didn't really change. All that changed was it became open book in a 24 hour period. Um, but for us, the exam was pretty fair. I do remember spending like 12 or 15 hours on it, but it was still pretty good. I just was kind of perfectionate the more than I needed to be probably. <laughs> yeah, so just uh, my comments on Rust. Uh, Rust wants to have all the errors happen at compile time and not runtime. Uh, also, Valgrind, because Grind is door, and Val is Valhalla, so door to Valhalla. Just a just a thing. Also, I had a different curriculum. I never took 252 because in my year there it was thrown together as memory management and multi-threading in the same course. Uh, so we never learned Valgrind before then. So I can't comment if there's a lot of aggregation from other courses in its current state. Yeah, even for the 2021 uh, cohort, we had 254 as well. So 252 happened, I think, starting from 2022. So yeah, I can't, can't comment much on that. And I, I, I do suspect that 
they will change up the content because it doesn't make any sense to teach the same thing. I do know Jeff actually designed 252's curriculum, so I'm pretty sure he would try to eliminate a lot of overlap between them since he teaches both of them, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> you can check the GitHub if you're really concerned. Yeah, ECE 254 uh, disappeared, and I think it got replaced by ECE 350, which is now real-time operating systems. Which is, from what I understand, like a really different course from 254. <laughs> like, it's very, very different. So, um, and, and like, the thing I also want to say is that, like, like okay, so, so, so Jeff and Patrick, and also one of the TAs from, from our class, like the, the genius, Dude that helped out. Um, they converted the, ent the entire thing to Rust in like from September to December before we took the course in, in January, right? And he recorded all the videos and stuff. Like they really put in a lot of hard work to do that. And so, like, what I would want to say is like the teaching team is honestly amazing and very committed. So I, I'm not scared about oh, like teaching like the same stuff or like you're not gonna learn something because they have proven time and again that they will teach you good stuff and you will enjoy the course, right? <laughs> like, like the content just changes along with time. So I'm, I'm not honestly too worried about that, but yeah. Something that I would like to add in terms of like the questions uh, regarding if this course is like similar to other courses that we've taken in the past. So 254, as mentioned in some of the comments, um, has been replaced by two other courses. And to um, both those courses, when they were splitting this one course up into two courses, both the profs spent almost like a year just trying to like ensure that both the courses went into details about their respective content and they did not overlap with other courses just because that was one of the major issue and the reason why the course was split in the first place was because there was so much overlap with like other courses and it didn't go in in depth into any of the course content and people in the previous years didn't like that so be assured that it does not repeat um, majority of the course content. I'm pretty sure it obviously touches on something here and there because they're within the same disciplinary, but like other than that, they're pretty um, diverse. So that's, sh sh I hope that's not the reason that you're not taking the course because it's definitely not. And that has been like stressed a lot by both our 350 prof and our and Jeff's Arnett. Um, that's been mentioned a lot of times. So yeah. Uh Chi Yun, I don't mean to call you up, but I, I I think I heard you saying that you also took took the course as well. I wonder if you have any opinions on it. Yeah, I think uh me like everybody really likes this course because it touches on like like performance and then how you can like things that you wouldn't notice during co-ops and then like and then obviously like lane graphs are really really useful and like in terms of debugging like to make things like to know what actually makes your program slow instead of just uh, assuming like this code is slow um yeah like i think nathan did a really great job on cover everything that I really agree. This is an amazing course that basically every 4B student who took it loves it. Yeah. Maybe I can add a quick point. So I think in other courses, I, I heard like they benchmark students' performances and then your grades get tanked because of that. <laughs> like um, so so in 459, it's it's also like for performance and they do have like a percentage of marks that's like, oh you you know, you gotta like speed up by a certain percentage, but like it's not like oh you gotta compete with the whole class and there's these like two geniuses <laughs> who gets like crazy performance and everyone else marks gets affected because of that. Like there's none of that. So you don't get like super stressed out just because you got to be the best at optimizing they just give you targets that are really uh, reasonable like hey you gotta speed up by like you know like let's say 20 percent to get full marks for this portion and it's only a portion it's not like the whole thing right um so so don't be afraid of that as well i, I would say uh, and also one more thing as well like sometimes like they they would the ta would mark it and they were running on a different server and then you're like hey why did i not get full mark because i ran i ran it on this server it got full marks like um you can like they're they're, they're nice so like you can talk to them they'll just rerun it for you and you just get your marks like yeah it's, it's all it's all good so yeah
All right, uh, I think we can move on to the next course. We spent a long time on this one. Uh, so uh, ECE 488, multivariable control systems. We've got right. all of these fun acronyms, CISO, MIMO, PID. Right, so I guess I'll uh, kind of start things off and then uh, I believe there are a few other panelists here that also have taken it so they can kind of fill in the blanks for me, uh, whatever I miss, I guess. Um, yeah, so the, this course is, um, it, it's a standalone course. So you don't, uh, other than EC380, you don't really need anything else. Uh, I know that in 4, 4A, uh, they offer a couple of controls courses, a total of three. Uh, but the, this one's interesting because it kind of takes on the ideas that you have uh, discussed in 380. And uh, so 380 is mostly focused on uh, single input, single output, or SISO systems. Um, what Professor Davison is, uh, who I had um, uh, during winter 2021, uh, how he focused on it was that the initial, like the first bit of the term was focused on uh, just a review of the 380 concepts. Uh, and then we talked about uh, limitations uh, associated with SISO systems. Systems. So uh, the whole point being um, that uh, in 380, you almost think that uh, single input, single output, it works. Uh, it works in all cases. So why on earth do we have other things to uh, care about? So that, that's when we start learning about all the uh, limitations that comes with um, that uh, why we actually need to carry out uh, into a, a multi-input, multi-output system, or even uh, sometimes uh, you could get, get by with a... a multi-input single output system or um, sorry, the other way around, single input multi output systems and uh, things like that. Um, the PID control section. So one of the things um, I found uh, is that with PID, there's a lot of different uh, methodologies uh, and they're really all theories. So uh, every, like there are different papers that have been released uh, regarding how you could carry out PID control. Uh, there were a total of uh, three that we learned uh, just a uh, high level, the algorithm, uh, how you'd carry it out. And that's about it. Um, and uh, he goes on to talk about it again it, when we talk about MIMO systems. One cool thing that I really liked uh, about the entire course, and I guess that's just coming from a little bit of a personal uh, preference, uh, is uh, he ties everything in with uh, the aerospace uh, industry. So uh, a lot of his examples will uh, coincide with uh, the Boeing 747, uh, whose controls uh, information all have been released to the public domain. So he uses a lot of that. Uh, and the assignment that you work on, uh, there's a total of, um, uh, we had, I believe, a total of four projects. Uh, well, sorry, no, three submissions, but each submission had uh, two little projects within it. And uh, the idea was that you would basically take the uh, topics that you discussed and apply it to, for our case, it was an uh, aiming system. Uh, so, uh, which would, uh, which basically is a system that, uh, as kind of the name suggests, it uh, looks, uh, it's used in military and things like that, trying to uh, aim for like uh, any targets and then uh, firing at it. So it's a complete balancing uh, system, like a, an, an inverted pendulum system some of that sort uh, that you uh, use MATLAB uh, to create uh, control, um, like your control uh, program for and uh, see how, how it all balances out. Um, make use of root lock plots. Uh, uh, Roth Hurwitz method is not heavily utilized in even though like in uh, exams, you're gonna see good use of it. Uh, and you kind of just need to have in the back of your head how you kind of quickly do it. it sounds a little daunting at first, but um, as you keep trying it out, you start seeing it, it becomes kind of almost second nature to you. Um, the assignments themselves, they did it. I, I didn't personally think that they took too, too long. Uh, I, I always like to go like write enough detail, like explain my entire thought process. So my reports ended up being quite long, but I, I've had friends who uh, submitted uh, smaller reports and uh, just got to the point what they thought was necessary and they scored the same. So uh, I wouldn't worry too, too much about it. Um, also, I'm not sure if you guys had um, the weird uh, MATLAB courses that we, we had to do. Uh, I think it was 204A and 204B. Uh, it's nothing, the like if you hated MATLAB from something like that, don't worry, the MATLAB here is a lot better. Uh, it's just simply application. You'll see that, uh, I personally thought that uh, the Mat MATLAB's real power was evident in this course uh, with all the inbuilt functions, like creating Nyquist plots and things like that. And just the data being shown in front of you. And as long as you know how to interpret it, you pretty much finish the lab. Um, 
other than that, yeah, I don't have much else to add uh, other than the fact that Professor Davidson is probably one of the best profs I've had in my entire university career. Um, the way he handled the entire course, like his course notes are just a godsend. Um, you simply just uh, have to attend his lectures, fill in the blanks, and if you study from them, you should be perfectly fine for the test. All right, I can add a couple things more to that. So Professor Davison is absolutely a phenomenal professor. He is like so easy to listen to. He's got lots of great anecdotes in class. He's a terrific teacher. He will make it clear. And this was my favorite class in undergrad. That's because I love control. It's the way I study for my master's now. Uh, so the labs for this, this class are all in MATLAB. I actually use Python for it. He gave me the option, but he suggested to use MATLAB. Um, and they're interesting. So I, it sounds like I had a slightly different one because I did it in 2020. So mine was uh, a cart with a double inverted pendulum on it. So then your two inputs are the force and torque applied to the, the, the cart and the, uh, the lower pendulum. And the outputs are the position and the angles of, of all the bits. Uh, so of course, the, the course starts with a review of EC380 and then goes into more depth into the, the single input, single output systems. So we look at things like in under what case is it possible to stabilize a system and then if it is possible what can we do so it turns out that if you have unstable poles and non-minimum phase zeros then there are certain limitations that you you cannot achieve a a controller which gives me at most this overshoot and at most this undershoot and at least this settling time etc so then it becomes a trade-off of you know we can make a controller that has really good overshoot but then bad undershoot or vice versa so you learn about these more interesting uh, trade-offs you can make. And at the, near the end of the course, you do optimal control. So not just find a control that stabilizes, we want to find a control that minimizes this cost integral. So you have a, a cost functional, uh, which is a function of the tracking error and the amount of effort you use in the controller. So then you can do some calculus to drive it and you can find this uh, linear feedback, which is you can prove is the best the best controller of all linear feedback controllers. And the bread and butter of the course is the multiple input, multiple output. So that means systems where you have multiple control inputs and multiple outputs. So of course, his example that he uses throughout the class is the Boeing 747. And so in doing this, you developed uh, a new math tool called states-based design. So where instead of just using Laplace transforms and frequency domain analysis with body plus and all that, now you have I think we did see it in one of the early calculus classes uh, where you represent a differential equation as a sequence of uh, first order differential equations that are all interconnected. And so this ends up being a very powerful technique and there are pros and cons of doing each one which the professor will tell you about in the class and give you lots of historical examples of so sort of the blunders that past control engineers uh, did when, when trying to develop these things. But these are incredibly powerful and useful techniques. So the 380 stuff gives you sort of the, the bare minimum of I can design a control which stabilizes the system. Uh, 488 lets you actually design a good controller for more interesting systems, not, not just trivial systems that are minimum, minimum phase, but how to deal with more complicated systems, how to create a control which you can prove, gives you the best performance, a good robustness and all that and how to deal with these more complicated systems where you have multiple transfer functions that are all connected to one of these MIMO systems. So I think to have interest in control system, the 48 is definitely one that's required. Um, just to add a point regarding um, applications to like, um, like jobs or interviews, um, I'm not sure how, uh, like I'd assume if you find a job that has like controls based uh, requirements, uh, they'll probably ask you questions uh, regarding the, the, this kind of stuff. Uh, I can't really speak to that too much, but uh, I had a discussion with Professor Davison uh, near the end um, uh, of the uh, term. And uh, one of the things he mentioned is that you, you won't really like in industry, you won't find like you can't just go into a control job controls is more of a thing that embeds itself within industries. Uh, like uh, there's a huge application for in power, in robotics, uh, 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 many other examples that are, uh, I can't really name at, the, at this moment, but yeah. Um, and so really it's more 
along the lines of uh, like I, I would look at it as a tool that you could use uh, in whatever field you're in to uh, further uh, make yourself more uh, competitive, more uh, uh, more of a worthwhile candidate uh, rather than like just a job in and of itself. One of the big applications for our controls nowadays is in uh, robotics and especially autonomous cars. So especially there's a special kind of control technique called model predictive control, which they like to use for controlling ro robots to have them go through paths, complicated uh, environments without hitting any obstacles. And they do same things for um, autonomous cars. Uh, also this control stuff is closely related to navigation. So like GPS navigation, where you have a bunch of sensors and you have to integrate these to uh, determine you know, position and orientation for uh, aircraft or vehicles or anything like that. Uh, that's these um, cabin filter, which is another important topic which is brought up in 48. All right. Uh, are there any are there any questions? Do people have questions about ECE 488? All right, I guess not. Um, so uh, the next course is ECE 457B, uh, Fundamentals of Computational Intelligence. So machine learning stuff, um, previously taught by, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm going to screw this up. Bakri Kare. Um, I took this course. This is one of the courses that you're required to take to complete the AI option, if that's what you're interested in. And in general, it was taken by many people. It is not related to EC 457A, if that's what you're thinking about, but it is kind of part of a three-part series in terms of 457A, 457B, and 457C. Um, 457A being genetic algorithms and uh, cooperative algorithms. It's just algorithms that kind of model real life, which is pretty interesting. And uh, 457C, which is um, regret, what was it? Reinforcement learning is another part of machine learning uh, that talks about, you know, how when you do a task, you reinforce it, good behavior and discourage bad behavior. But then 457B uh, fits in the middle. It is the most closest to a very popular course, probably CS480. It is just like the title says, basically an introduction to machine learning. The building blocks and the tools that you need to be able to create an intelligent system is what this course is about. It starts off with the um, kind of the idea, the examples that you see right now in industry, you know, that machines are beating humans. They beat them at chess a long time ago, and now they're beating them at more complicated things. And it starts defining, you know, what is intelligence and how can we achieve intelligence it does uh, talk about the differences between supervised and unsupervised learning. And in terms of workload, it does have three assignments, three labs in total. So the first lab, well, all labs in general for them had a lot of coding and report writing, but it wasn't typical coding that you do for other courses. It's not like you write them and solve the test cases. It's more like you design what you want. This course let you use whatever language you wanted to use, so it didn't matter what, but most people ended up using Python because that's kind of the standard of what you do. The tutorials were really helpful too. And it's more like you're trying to create a report or something for people, for the TAs to read, for them to investigate and look at. So the report would be like, you explain to them how you're going to run it and in the readme, and then the, they run it. But you obviously have some guidelines, right? So the guidelines are like, you have to be able to create a neural network. The neural network has to run these and you have to summarize it all in a table. And then based on those numbers, they'll know like, okay, this makes sense or this didn't make sense. And then you describe um, 
a lot of machine learning is about fine tuning little parameters, right? I changed this parameter, I changed this lambda, I changed this to 0 0.1 instead of 0 0.03. And it can be annoying at sometimes and be tedious, but I think what you should do is appreciate like what those numbers are actually changing, right? Because they do change something. It changes like how much it's willing to explore new ones versus uh, continue to stick with previous, previous solutions instead of exploring new solutions or different ones. And so, um, Professor Professor Curry is super nice and super willing to help you. He actually changed the deadlines from one week to two weeks for our class, which he said he had never done. But I don't know. I believe him. But either way, it's he's nice and we're thankful for it. He uh, was really communicative on Piazza. He gave uh, extensions when people needed them, not too much so, but like at a reasonable amount, which was great. And uh, I don't think there was a final exam. No, I don't think there was. I think it was just, I don't know. I can't remember exactly what the breakdown was. I think it was these three assignments and then something else. Oh, there was quizzes, quizzes. Yeah, there was three quizzes. Uh, it was three labs and three quizzes. The quizzes were uh, pretty nice. Like, uh, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I think you could do very well on the quizzes if you just did like basic study and you knew what you were talking about. If you just went through his notes what he has is he has slides for all of you, for all of you to everything that he, he wrote on and he added it and they were well written and were useful to what you were trying to do. And he had really good animations too. So, oh yeah, there's also uh, fuzzy. So the course is kind of split into two major parts, I would say. So it's like uh, neural networks and everything associated with them at the start. And it's explained very well, but the other half is fuzzy logic. For neural networks, I think you'd be pretty shocked, especially if you came from a CS course, how like quickly he'll go through them. It'll be like two or three weeks and it's done. But I like that it gives you what you need to know what a neural network is to get it to run, to get it to do what it needs to do. So I thought it was a good course for that. But if you want to know more about the math and stuff, you could do a CS course, but he gives you basically enough. Fuzzy logic it wasn't everyone's favorite, but it seems based on the feedback over the last few years, many people didn't like fuzzy logic. So he has like shrunk it down. I think he loves that. I think he wrote the textbook on fuzzy logic, but he's kind of adapted to his students. So for fuzzy logic, it's like trying to get the computer to understand vague statements like you would talk about as a human. Like you'd say, oh, this, co this cup of coffee is very hot versus, um, oh, it is not too sunny, right? So based on that, you would create like mathematical formulations in code to slightly decrease the temperature stat or slightly increase it and it's just kind of like the reasoning why that's useful but there's only one assignment on it and the quiz isn't too complicated on it either and it's marked very easily i would say so it he just wants you to learn the concepts and you apply them in labs and in the quizzes but it's nothing too crazy it's a useful course if you want to learn more about machine learning and i would definitely recommend it if you want to do just kind of dip your toe into it because it's very surface level and you'd have to take more complicated ones to learn more. Um, in terms of effort, I think the labs were like, also probably a little bit longer just because the lab, the report write-ups for me, I typed them all out. I mean, I think everyone did, but they can get very, very long, especially when you're trying to write tables and you're trying to like write the things. So yeah, definitely like consider like eight to 10 hours probably spent on a lab, especially if sometimes like, people don't know right people aren't experts with the libraries that you use on python and that'll take a very long time but it's okay you'll figure it out you have your classmates to help you and compare results so you can compare them and that's very useful but yeah i'll let other people mention how they liked it too uh Nathaniel, sorry I, I i didn't take the course but i was curious what kind of uh, python libraries were used So that's a good question. Um, you have to use uh, not B for sure to be able to do scientific operations that you know you could normally do by hand, like linear algebra and matrices and multiplications to do fast operations because of um, vectorization. Vectorization just means instead of doing a for loop, which can be very very slow, you can use matrices, which means like apply operations on whole matrices like row vectors of a matrix at a time or matrix to matrix, matrix multiplication, things like that. That's what that was mainly used for. But then after that, the 
it starts off pretty slow. It starts off with just like Numpy and like Skippy and like those kind of like surface courses, which by the way, uh, that's a big plus. If you want to go into AI, this course will give you exposure to that. And like, if you have not known the interviews, you'll be fried. But if you have this experience, at least you'll be able to say something and a valuable something. And then when it gets to neural networks, they actually do a push. And I really like that they had the TAs explain to us how to use TensorFlow, how to use OpenCV, uh, OpenCV maybe not so much, but we did use uh, TensorFlow and I think PyTorch. Sorry, I took a bunch of AI courses. I don't remember where I did where, but definitely, definitely TensorFlow and PyTorch, I think, because it you don't have to write your own neural network. You just say like import neural network, but then you have to like, in the report explain how you change the parameters and that's just changing the parameters on the actual library and so these are all super keywords super good things that you can mention in an interview and actually say like this is how i did it and you'll really appreciate all the work that companies have done already for you in the libraries they have made you know neural networks already for you they have made um there's a there's a really cool algorithm that i would recommend everyone to look up called the k-means algorithm which is just to be able to sort things it's all super valuable and super cool for anything related to AI. So if you uh, are interested in learning just how to use those Python ones, this course is a great way to teach you even just the basics of how to use Python to use it to do machine learning. So yeah. Thanks a lot for the answer. Uh, maybe I can yeah. move on. So I think someone was asking in the chat of um, what do you think about the AI process or AI option in terms of the job industry? Maybe I'll just give like a two minutes thing on my experience. So. Uh, I took CS four eighty. Okay, I I I just um so I I got into AI option and then continued to take CS four eighty in three A, because I wanted a AI related um co op for my fourth co op. Um, so I I took that and then in CS four eighty. So I I'm sorry, this is not easy, but um they had like an optional cross project that I also did. Um, and we tried to train a GAN network for online sexual predator that de de detect, um, detection. Anyway, so um, I actually got a bunch of interviews for AI jobs, um, uh, even one from NVIDIA, I remember, and one from Uber as well, uh, ATG. And yeah, there were a few pretty um, high profile ones there. But the thing is, I, I honestly got wrecked <laughs> um, in, in a lot of them. Uh, I, I still got a few offers uh, and uh, I actually went to Capital One as a data scientist right after that, that term because pretty much because of the course. So it, it did help me there. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. As, as until I said, yeah, because like I, even though I got like Uber and, um, and, uh, and NVIDIA, I, I just got wrecked directly uh, in their interviews because the, the courses honestly aren't enough. Um, I, I would say uh, from my experience as well, I, I know of other people who really got into AI. Like I know someone who has done a few co-ops in Facebook AI research and he hasn't taken any of these courses, but he's, like you, you have to understand yourself. I, I'll, I'll just bring this point up because I learn better in classrooms, so I take courses. But if you learn better through side projects, I think they are really, really powerful as well. And you can really get like actual AI jobs. I, I think that's, that's definitely a, a thing. It's just that, yeah. So hopefully that, that answers the question. Nathaniel, Nathan, Nathan, I think you have more experience with this as well. So if you want to add anything in. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Ken said too. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, people do get AI jobs even as undergrad students, but like you will definitely not fit the requirements when you apply to them. The, uh, you can apply to them, you can try, but like you're definitely like shooting for a home run when you do. And the, uh, the experience that people have is with AI jobs, normally they do start at a small company first and then they go on to a big company. But I think it's AI right now the way it is in industry is how badly you want it. You know, if you're willing to take a pay cut, if you want to go to a small company, like they will hire you because everybody wants to do AI. But if you want to have like, you could get a much, much higher paying job just fixing websites at a different company and a bigger one maybe and with more benefits, but it's kind of up to you. Uh, like, I think Ken is like really into AI way even more than I am and really good and better at it than I am. But for me, I just did it because I am interested in it and I want to do it in the future, but right now I'm not even doing AI at my job. And for me, that's okay. I just wanted to get a lot of exposure to it so that I can understand if I like it and then, you know, come back to grad school later if I really want to do it. So it's, it's up to you, you know, I, I would say kind of gauge what you want to do and speak, pick specifically because even AI, you can't just say I do AI, right? AI is a huge 
field and you'd have to pick like, do you want to specialize in speech recognition or in image recognition or in um, like behavior models. So you have to think about things like that in terms of jobs too. Uh, sorry, sorry, I know we're running late on time. I just add a quick thing as well to just what I can just say. Um, so uh, yeah, the reason why I didn't graduate with uh, AI option, I just dropped it <laughs> uh, pretty much because um, I, I didn't quite agree with the courses I needed to take. And yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not really doing AI anymore. Uh, I'm more focused on HCI right now. But uh, the, the thing is that I want to add is that uh, a lot of the jobs that you get at smaller companies, um, most of them are not really AI. <laughs> um, you just go in there and be like, import TensorFlow. And then you spend a bunch of time either writing other code to support the actual people doing AI, or you run a bunch of code to like manually tweak parameters, which is not very fun. So be aware of that. Um, the real AI jobs are few and far between, and you really have to work for it. Just as I told you, like you really have to put in all your time just to learn to, to catch up to that level. And also just a quick state as well. Like I think the real jobs, like full-time wise, um, real AI jobs probably need at least a master's, if not a PhD. That's kind of where it is right now. So yeah, hopefully that helps. All right. Um, yeah, we, we are a bit behind, so uh, we'll move on to the next course, which is ECE 423, uh, Embedded Computer Systems. Uh, so this is taught by Rodolfo Pelizzoni. Um, and he, the, he has a website, so you can go to that link and uh, look for yourself. Um, so I had this course in my final year, and I thought it was pretty good. Uh, a bit of overlap with EC455, but it focuses more on the practical lore, like how to code, how to actually plan out software. Uh, the lab project had three milestones uh, that involved, uh, for us, it was creating a video playback on the FPGAs in the lab, but it was mostly just, um, it wasn't like configuring the FPGAs, it was coding it. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, Rodolfo is an interesting prop if you ever had him. Let's grab it. I didn't have him in 224, so, but in, uh, he definitely, from what I've heard, taught a lot better in four, to fourth years than he did to second years, since he is somewhat more technical. So, um, I also did not take, or I did not take this course, um, but I heard that it, it was difficult and more difficult than people thought. Uh, I think the people who really thrived in this, like embedded for the co-ops and they're really good at embedded. So if you really wanna go down this path, you should, you should probably consider it. But yeah. I heard it was like more difficult than it needed to be. Yeah, only take this course if you actually want to do embedded stuff, I'd say. <laughs> if you're yeah, good you're at embedded, like, water, leave it at that. It, it's not a bird course, I think, by any means. <laughs> the labs were, they, they took a lot of work. Uh, yeah, Chi Yuan took this course, um, this term, so if he's online. Yeah, they also, yeah. Mine was also still in person, so I don't can't comment on the online like either no i didn't take 420 so sorry oh shoot no, sorry i was no. i was uh 416. yeah i was mentioning him for 416 because there's a question about 416 in the chat but 416 is not on the agenda um oh. yeah. yeah so i i suppose um then for this course if you enjoyed uh, ECE 350, like real-time operating system. Is it similar to that sort of stuff? I didn't take 350. I think he was like the, the multi-thread part of it, of 254. Didn't have that course either. You should take, uh, yeah, you have taken 254 into 20. Oh, 254, yeah, I thought you said 354. Uh, no, it, it, it is closer to 224, 
then I'd say it is too. Um, I thought this course was like two, 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 which is what pushed me away from it because it's like the pipelining and the like, yeah, like ALU and stuff like in inside the CPU. Well, the lab was still very much just coding in C. Um, that's all we really did was coding in C, how to hook up to the uh, memory managed uh, I.O., uh, how to grab data off the SD card, how to convert that data into frames to show and how to control it with uh, the buttons on the FPGAs in the lab, uh, which are also memory mapped I.O. So it's kind of like 224 with some of the concepts of 222 and a bunch of scheduling. <laughs> like scheduling for embedded stuff is pretty important. Uh, which is where the crossover with 455 comes from, because there's a lot of scheduling in 455 that you focus on. Yeah, we're not talking about 455, but I found that 455 had a lot more scheduling than I thought existed in the world. And it was an okay course, but it rarely hit me hard because I wasn't an embedded developer. So again, probably the biggest emphasize is like if, if you don't know any embedded and you like are only kind of interested in it, probably avoid this course. Like the final lab project was pretty cool. And I, I have used it in a bunch of embedded job interviews. And usually you get pretty good feedback on it sounding like a cool project. Uh, there's one course I can the the course you have to like make an MP3 player that has a bunch of overlap with what you'll be doing in the lab here. Here what course that is though. Two two four, I think. Is that two two four. So yeah, two two four I think would be the best comparison for the lab. All right, and it does it does sound like that it is a continuation of ECE. 350. Um, oh, I'm taking that course right now, so I can't say much. Uh, so I guess we can move on to the next course, which is uh, ECE 493T21. Uh, I think it's now an actual full course, ECE 495, Autonomous Vehicles, um, by, oh, this name is even less pronounceable, Kerstoff Sarnecki. Did anyone take this course? Any of our panelists? Uh, I guess not. I, I can kind of maybe speak a bit about it because um, a few of the my um my teammates in my FIDP did take this course and we did talk about it a little bit. So take it with a huge grain of salt. I mean, like, I'm not. Yeah, I didn't take the course, but from what I've heard, um, so it, it covers some like really interesting topics, like uh um like lane detection. Uh, they they kind of bring you through the uh, the whole ML neural network thing as well. Uh, assignments were I think like. Was it weekly or like bi-weekly? It was, it was, yeah, it was quite a bit there as well. And yeah, you, you do like, you know, use TensorFlow and whatnot you know, during the assignments from what I've heard. Uh, yeah, so so this this is another course where they kind of go through a bunch of things, but like pretty surface level. Um, so if you want to learn like each, any one of these like very detailed, you, you're probably not going to get that. But you, what you do get is like a good exposure to a bunch of like pretty interesting topics. And if you think you like one of them more, you can obviously study them more yourself or take more courses in following terms or you know even go to grad school for it but but yeah it does give you a, a pretty good broad uh, kind of exposure just like i guess if you took um 457a uh it's kind of like that you know you can get a, a bunch of algorithms that are pretty cool um and you kind of do some small assignments to see how cool they are and to apply them and you know it's pretty satisfying from the assignments from what i've heard um however i will say this um i've heard from my friends that uh the organization of this course wasn't the best in this winter uh, but I'll, I'll, I don't know if that's a one-off thing or, you know, if, if that's going to be a thing again. 
uh, with a different instructor, so I can't say a lot to that. Yeah, sorry, uh, Tian, sorry, I'm not, I'm, I don't know if you're talking about this course, if you are, uh, yeah, feel free to. Oh, I'm talking about 416, sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because from what I've heard, the, the assignments were uh, weren't too bad, but but there were quite a few of them, um, as well for <laughs> for this course. That's, that's why I thought you were talking about this course. <laughs> um, Sorry. Yeah. No. 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 No issues. <laughs> I also didn't take this course, but I really wish I did, and I couldn't take it because you had to take a CS course for the AI option. But it looked really cool, and it's only sparsely offered. So. I would actually maybe say consider it a bit lucky if you guys can take it because it's not offered every year. It's only offered sometimes. It, I think it, it's not material that's too difficult to learn on your own. From what I heard and I was looking on our class chat was the professor was kind of just sending them Stanford lectures. <laughs> he wasn't even really doing the lectures. He was just giving, sending them links to lectures on YouTube. And I heard they were actually really good. Like they did in mind, the lectures were really well done. And then they supplemented it with number file videos. If you guys know them, they're really good. But it, it I don't know about the, the ECT version because I didn't do them, but I took computer vision for CS, which talked a lot about the application to cars. And a lot of it is linear algebra. Again, it's about convolution with matrices to be able to find images and find boundaries between images and then classify those images. And then, you know, like um, create like filters and blurs and stuff. I think they used, I'm uh, pretty sure, I know that they used notebooks, Jupyter notebooks to do their assignments. And it was like, you know, they fill them out and then you kind of fill in the blanks for, excuse me, for the cells that are missing. So uh, I think it's really good course. It's just a bit more surface level than a CS course and obviously more surface level than a master's course. But from what I heard, it was really good. I also heard the disorganization comments that Ken mentioned, but I think that was a product of it being online. So maybe if it was in person, it'd be better. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, think about it as the labs are Jupyter Notebooks with Python, where you get to use all the libraries that I mentioned before, but specifically for autonomous cars. And this is the only course that will specifically talk about the applications of LiDAR sensors, you know, as opposed to just the math. This engineering course will talk more about like sensors and maybe the voltages and the bits and stuff and how, why that's important. The computer vision course was CS484. From what I understand, CS484, just as like many of the CS courses, they actually go into way more math than whatever you would get in engineering. So that's oh a God. good- CS484 yeah. was very, very hard. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you survived it. Good job, by the way. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. <laughs> that's I, yeah, that, I that's a really hard course. But yeah, the, uh, the quizzes were like in the 50s ranges and stuff. So, and the assignments take many, many hours. Follow me on Reddit if you want to find more. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I barely walked out of CS four D myself. But um, yeah, I, I would say like like again like if you're specifically interested in any one of these topics, then take the specific course for it. But if you're just looking for more of a you know like a like more, almost like a shopping mall, you know, just look and see kind of thing and like learn all the fun stuff, then then yeah, then this is a good course for you. Yeah, that makes sense. Kind of a more overview is EC if you want more in depth with CS, but it will be harder for your engineering brain. All right, uh, I guess we can move on to the last course, uh, ECE 464, High Voltage Engineering and Power System Protection uh, by Shisha Jairam, last term. Right, so this is the other technical elective that I took in my 4B term. Um, I want to caveat that this course uh, really does benefit from it being taught live as opposed to being taught online. It, it's a really, really interesting course if you're into power. Um, in terms of uh, prerequisite knowledge, uh, I mean, if you're in electrical and you chose uh, the power stream, I guess, um, by taking the specific power course, I, I, I think like we had uh, EC351, I think it was called, or sorry, 361. Um, that got broken up into two different power courses, like one, uh, a machines course in second year, and then uh, a, um, um, what do you call it, a distribution course, I think, in third year. Uh, nonetheless, uh, 
it's interesting in the sense that uh, you start talking about um, well, the main focus of the uh, course is uh, one textbook uh, by Kuffel, uh, where you pretty much talk about uh, how you generate high voltage uh, AC and DC signals. The whole perspective or the objective in this course is uh, testing. So you're not thinking of three phase systems anymore you're thinking of just single phase systems uh working with test transformers uh and the objective is uh like say you have a piece of transmission line and uh you you have rated it for a certain level of current uh and voltage withstandability uh and you want to test that can it handle that generally the rules are that uh, so you have like the ieee standards and whatnot that you follow in order for that but uh to make give it ratings, but on top of that, you want to build in other uh, fail safes so the system doesn't, or that particular part of your uh, grid doesn't uh, break off or uh, essentially uh, uh, disconnect itself due to over, over voltage conditions or over current conditions. Uh, so it's a lot of uh, testing based uh, stuff that we, we talked about. Um, the power system protection part is uh, secondary uh in the course really it, it sounds really interesting and there's a lot more to be learned uh i personally think that this course is probably better as a uh, a grad course because uh, the same course is offered in graduate studies uh but in far more detail so you actually learn a lot more uh in the undergrad level you pretty much just get enough to get your feet wet uh and uh, personally for me i was kind of left uh, a little bit uh, hungry for knowledge uh, after afterwards with this course the labs are pretty straightforward um i mean we we kind of had a situation where because you have to go into the high voltage lab to do all uh, all of these and it's, it's a really cool state-of-the-art lab uh but uh, given the pandemic we weren't allowed to go in uh the issue really just uh, became that um the, the lab instructor would just record uh him doing the lab for us and then give us the numbers and we just kind of do the analysis so that really kill the fun out of it uh, and the console assignment was really just uh, something that was rushed at the very end um i, I think like uh, we've given her a lot of feedback uh in terms of uh how she can run the course differently so that uh like uh future uh offerings find it a, a, a lot more uh streamlined a lot more interesting uh and uh, she she she's she's a really nice person though. Like uh, she's open to comments. She always tries to adapt to uh, what we need in order to make the course uh, fruitful and enjoyable. Um, so yeah, um, and the one thing I forgot to mention is that there's one section. So it's broken up into three sections. You have the high voltage, um, AC, DC and impulse testing uh, stuff. That's part A. Then part B is when you talk about different kinds of installations, so solid, liquid and gas installations. Uh, and then part C is your power system protection stuff. Um, the way she structures it is uh, the midterm is just based on part A. Uh, the Then she does uh, three quizzes for part B. And then for the final, she tests you on part C and uh, some of uh, the stuff that she wasn't able to test you on from part A. Uh, all in all, it, it was a straightforward course. Like if you are into power, you understand the stuff, then it should, it should be a, a, it should be a pretty, uh, pretty easy to, thing for you to handle. But um, yeah, I think we kind of suffered a little bit just from uh, uh, kind of poor planning and whatnot. So I, I'd assume that that those kind of bugs would be ironed out by uh, by the time you guys take it. All right, uh, are there any questions? Okay, so this is the last course on the agenda. So, um, I guess if you want, if you want to leave, uh, you can. Um, but like, this is now more of a free discussion. I see in the chat there are, there's someone who's interested in ECE four zero nine. Um, there's also interest in ECE four one six. So, uh, if I don't know, I guess we could start with. Um, I think someone had a meeting at 8.30. So we could start with 409. Who, who had the meeting? 
uh, Chi Ren, are you okay with uh, waiting until after we talk about 409 to talk about 416? Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't I don't know if anyone here took 409. I had some buddies that took it. I think their prof was maybe Agnews, an older guy, I don't remember. They said it was all right, lots of memorization. Uh, the course notes was just one big word doc, if I recall. That might have just been his teaching of it though. But I didn't take it, so I can't directly comment. Yeah, so yeah, it was taught last term by Gordon Agnew. Um, let me find, let me see if I can pull up the syllabus. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, um, you can find like the syllabi for all these technical lessons at the department website. Um, I pushed hard to get them updated, so they're now like actually updated for this year. Um, sorry, I don't know if I'm, I'm cutting into anything, but if I'm not, I think there was a question about taking CS courses as an ECE. Maybe uh, I can start saying something about it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, as Natalia just said, yeah, it was freaking hard, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so, so one thing I'll say is that um, start early if you want to plan to get into it. As in early, as in like, like don't wait till like two weeks before the term starts. Like, start like eight weeks before the term starts. Start start emailing, you know, the easy, uh, stuff. Start emailing the CS stuff. Us like us around, really understand what 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 is the process like. I I think the process changed a lot since I took it because um when I took it it was uh okay so for context there are two kinds of uh there 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 are two kinds of uh of uh, CS courses right there are the, like the the 300, 400 courses right. And then there are like the, the grad courses, the 600, 700, 800 courses. All right. For the undergrad courses, if you want to take it as an undergrad ECE, as, as Nathaniel just said, it's, it's really tough. Um, I think every year they have like only a few spots for engineering kids, not just ECE, like all engineering. So um, yeah, you, you kind of have to just, yeah. Um, I, I think they look at your results. I'm, I'm really not sure about that. But for, for me, what, what worked out was I really explained to them, like, even though I did not have the prerequisites, um, maybe because it was because of my results, I am not sure. Um, obviously, they, they don't tell you that. But I really explained to them how it would impact my career and why it was important for me to take it. Uh, and so maybe that helped out. So really explaining why it's important to you to take the course at the time that you choose to take it. Um, and, for, and, and if you want to take like a CS 700 or 800 course, uh, and you want to count that as a TE, which um, I did at, at, at one point, you just go straight to the instructor and ask them because for a 700, 800 course, um, the, the instructor will pretty much decide who gets in. But for 400 courses, the instructor do not get to decide. It, it's the, uh, the CS um, stuff and the EC stuff that, that does more of the, the job there. Um, the tenure, I'm not sure if, oh, I, I don't think he's here anymore, but um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers to your, your question though. Yeah, so uh, just just uh, going back to ECE 409, I found the outline, um, which is a PowerPoint of all things. Um, and it's not on the website, so I'll, I'll, get, I'll ask the department to upload it. Um, so the topics are introduction to cryptology, theory of secure communications, like entropy, random cipher model, uh, networks and systems, points of attacks, end-to-end -end encryption, uh, conventional cryptographic systems, which is like, there's a huge list of like ciphers. Um, and then uh, finite field arithmetic. So, oh, modular arithmetic, that's, that's a huge thing. Um, Professor Trepunatara in ECE 406, um, really, really, really went on uh, modular arithmetic for like the first two weeks. Um, and there's protocols and applications. So like, uh, I guess 
SSL, TLS, firewalls, um, and then implementations like smart cards, wireless network security, blockchains. Uh, for the as for the AI option, uh, so yeah, getting into CS courses, CS four hundred courses as an ECE student is really really hard. Um, so the CS department prioritizes CS students, right? So you can't even like hope to get in if there's no space, um, and. They, they, what what they usually do is they wait until until like two weeks into the term when like it opens up to everyone and then they they essentially just prioritize you um, in that like kind of ad drop free for all period. Um, yeah, it's it's wild. Uh, yeah, ECE452 is not uh, offered. So, uh, in for 4B in yeah, so spring 2022. Yeah. As far as I know, maybe, maybe, maybe like there's going to be the department sending out like the survey, so maybe they'll put it up. Um, going going back to the artificial intelligence, uh, well, the CS courses. Um, yeah, Douglas Harder has a website and uh, there's a better explanation of uh, how exactly you can get into a CS course as an ECE student. Um, there was a question about ECE, oh no, where did it go? I think it was like 474. Did anyone take that course? I'm going to take that as a no. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Chi and you wanted to talk about uh, 416, right? I, I saw like a huge conversation in the chat. Is there anything oh, yeah. you want to add? Um, I mean, I could get, I could go over like the overview pretty quickly. If we have the time, but do you want to do that? So, yeah, so for 416, um, so if he really enjoys 358, he would actually really enjoy 416 as well. Because uh, 358, basically you learn about the OSI stack, but mainly the, top four so data network transport and then session but we didn't touch a lot about application that's where 416 one of the unit in 416 basically we like 416 talks a lot for like application and how it's being used in industry like the protocols so like in application layer you learn about like dns um you learn about like media support like media support protocols like uh, Dash, so like dynamic HTTP streaming, how like it can be implemented. So all the modern streaming um, video sites like YouTube, Netflix, all uses that, and how they like <clears throat> how they utilize the protocol and build like their system. And uh, yeah, so application layer, and then we also have a unit that focus hard on like cellular networks. And how the mobile networks transition like evolutes from 2G to 4G. And we talked about like mobility management, like where how your mobile is being tracked or how your how roaming is being done and things like that on um, for cellular networks. So but it's mainly focused focus on 4G. And we talk a little bit about 5G as well. And then another unit that I really like is the security part. So security we talked about, because I didn't take the, uh, there's a security, dedicated security course as well, but this one's really good too. So it talks about asymmetrical, symmetrical, um, like 
public key encryption and uh, how they work like in terms of mathematics, but also like how they are being used in like TLS, so the HTTPS, as well as um, what do you call it? The digital signature, like how the process works, like how the digital signature process works in TLS as well. Yeah, so I find security really useful. So yeah, I find also in terms of the course, uh, it's pretty easy in terms of uh, marking. So it's mainly assignments and quizzes. And as long as you read the lecture and then understand it and then did a little bit of problems, like did the actual assignments, then you'll be fine for the quizzes. And then for the final, it's also a big quiz. So it's slightly longer than your regular quiz, but it's pretty easy as well. And then at the end of the term, like you have to deliver um, a research survey paper. Basically, you choose an advanced topic in the like networking. So I choose, uh, I think, ad hoc networks. Like I choose research like uh, ad hoc networks, where it's focus like the protocol that focus on uh, energy efficiency. Um, so basically, you need to read at least ten papers, but that's stated at the start of the term. So you got one turn to do it, but. Yeah, so it's a survey. So you basically summarize and connects all the paper and then, yeah. And then I find it pretty useful for, like, even if you're just average software engineer doing only in the application layer, because uh, most people, most developers will only touch the application layer, not even like all the OSI layer down below, but it also has like a lot of application protocol stats very useful to us. And then obviously, if you want to learn more about mobility networks, it's super useful to have that background, like to see why, basically how it evolutes to 5G and then how it's like, how like different application or how mobile networks are like basically enabling platform for uh, newer applications. Yeah, cool. Uh, any questions? That was a lot. I think there was a, I think there was a question on uh, recommending CSE or NSE. Uh, so maybe I can just start on that. Um, yeah, some of the, so for NSE, uh, ENVS 200 was really fun, to be honest. Um, so I took it last spring, 4A. So it was uh, in lockdown. <laughs> So normally, if it's not locked down, you actually get to have field trips and like you, if you get to actually go in the wild and do some learn some really cool stuff like, you know, the impact of human activities and whatnot. And I, I thought it was a pretty good thing that engineers may be aware of that. Uh, but during lockdown, we had to like go out there and collect leaves on our own and um, record bird sounds and it was honestly pretty cool. Uh, so I would encourage you, if, if anything, just to have a change of pace, right? Like you're not just staring at your screen, you're going out there doing fun stuff, um, learning cool stuff about, you know, your kind of uh, surroundings as well. Uh, so ENVS 200 is one, uh, BAT 320, that was cool. Uh, BAT 320 is uh, like an entrepreneurship kind of course. I took it in 2A, 2B, I, I, don't, I don't remember, one, one of those. Um, you had to like come up with like a small project, think of like how it, you would start up as a business on that project uh, and pitch it and, and like, yeah, it, it, was, it was fun. Um, so if you're interested in, in startups, like that's definitely something to, to go for. Uh, lastly, for uh, another CSE, uh, Japan 101R. <laughs> if you're a fan of the Japanese culture and language, uh, yeah, must take. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty nice course to have. Teachers were nice as well, so would recommend that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if anyone else has any NSE or CSE recommendations. Wouldn't necessarily recommend EC403 thermal, uh, but the math in it when we was taught in my year uh, was math you should be good at at this point and the concepts weren't too bad it's not if you hear like horror stories from mac for thermo their thermo course is really intense compared to ours um but if you need an intensive nsc actually do you guys even have intensive nscs anymore uh yeah the okay great uh this is for class of 2022 yeah so class of 2022 yes class of 2023 yes Class of 2024, I believe, no. Okay. So yeah, for an intensive NSE is pretty, I don't want to say easy, but it, 
it was one of my higher marks that year just because the math is like just ec205 math um which i don't know we've repeated a lot since then i think it's just differential equation solvings mostly um, and then i took like one of the space courses for my non-intensive nsc but hopefully you filled that one out by now at least if you're going into fourth year <laughs> Also, there's no lab component to EC403, uh, 404, or 405, I believe. Um, at least no lab course. I think it was introduction to astronomy online. And the most math intense it got was angles of a triangle. So. Hopefully you can do a little bit of trig. Take that one. It was pretty straightforward. They said you had to watch the six hour lectures each week. I didn't. It was fine. I believe it's Psi 238. It might have been. I can double check. Let me get my calendar out. Jeez. Yeah, you took it on. You took it through uh, CEL, right? Center for Extended Learning, the actual online offer for astronomy. Is that? That's no, what it you was said? just it was just online. It was it was offered in person or in line and online back in twenty sixteen. No, twenty seventeen. I just took the online one. Yeah. So yeah, that's the that's the CEL. Version, yeah, side two thirty. Uh, so there. Let's see. How is job search? Uh, I think there's a profile now, class profile for at least twenty twenty one. So from what I remember from my class profile, yeah, um, feel free to add on if anyone remembers better. <laughs> from what I remember, I think um, most of the class got full-time offers by like the six co-op like, like term. And, um, and, and I think a lot of it, I think half of the, the, like half of the people going back to industry like went back to their, like one of the previous co-op employers. So maybe that, that's something to note. Um, yeah, it's, it's relative for sure. Yeah. Hundred percent, but but still, like most people actually manage to 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 get jobs, and and even if like you get jobs late, like like it, it doesn't mean anything, right? It's just um yeah, it, it's just it's just um by time you you will get something for sure. So for example, I I I know someone who did not get an offer till like March or April, so like for B term, but then after that he got multiple offers. <laughs> Because at, by that time he had applied to like three four hundred jobs on LinkedIn and whatnot, and then got like a ton of interview practice, and then he he now has an offer to go to Kelly as well. So like, yeah, like it's gonna be stressful for sure. But yeah, just uh, be patient and grind on. Yeah, I, I took a bit of a break after graduating because I'd planned to take a trip, but that 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 didn't happen because of COVID, and I I didn't really get an earnest offers until May. I didn't really start applying until. March, the earliest. So, um, yeah, but C is it's pretty good. But I think if you're gonna go for like the more closely you get to hardware, I think the the less jobs there are in general. <laughs> I was going for embedded jobs as well, which might have skewed my time frame a bit, or to just software. Oh, I took history of music and film, and that was actually a pretty interesting course. Prof also touched on some of the technology of film and music and film, uh, which is cool to see from a CE perspective, I guess. And the course itself is pretty easy. What's the, do you know the course code for the music history? Thank you for uh, 246, as I mentioned. 
So 140 is the popular music history and then 246 is film music history. I'm not sure how to take a studio course. Let me see. I think I saw it on CSC website where like you can basically take all the music course, but you gotta talk with harder to get the form to write overwrite. But in reality, they don't even check. Like I emailed, they just said, just take it. So you can double check with like the EC department. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, we should wrap it up. It sounds like everyone's getting really tired. Um, also okay. like, so maybe um if there's two minutes i can just plug in something as well uh sure so, okay yeah uh, so so i, I just want to briefly talk about cs 800 courses i i know it sounds crazy but like just hear me out <laughs> everyone um so uh basically like um if anyone here is like really into research and has done ura or whatnot and like just wants to learn about research itself like what is research um, you know, like what kind of research happens in an area you like, for example, if you really like networks, what kind of research happens there? If you really like graphics and, you know, like video game and motion capture, like what kind of research happens there? If you really like conversation and agents, you know, reinforcement learning, what kind of research happens there? Like, if you really want to learn about the research side of things, the 800 courses are the way to go. Uh, undergrad can take them because all you have to do is to just, just to get an instructor to say yes. The instructor has absolute power over 800 courses. That's how it works. It's different from undergrad courses. And uh, when you're in 800 courses, what you do is every week or so you, you like, read papers and then you will talk about papers with your student, uh, with your classmates. So it's not like lectures or anything like, like students give lectures basically. Like, so like, hey, everyone pick a paper you like, right? And then read about it and then give a lecture, like a short lecture about it and then talk about it. And then you, you can also get to do your, your own side project on the topic itself. So that, that might be something that will even help with jobs as well. So, and then obviously for grad school, so I'll just, Want to plug it out there that it, it's a thing that I, I don't think most ECE students are aware of but but it's definitely something out there in our school that um if it's useful go for it but yeah thanks all right thank you ken and uh thank you to all of our panelists um of which two already left but i've already messaged them um thanking them and and uh, thank you to everyone who attended, um, of which there are only four people left. <laughs> so uh, I think everyone left earlier. So yeah, um, we have a, a four a technical elective session that will be happening in August. Um, so I'll be messaging the panelists again asking if they'd like to attend that one. And if you'd like to attend, um, you can uh, you can sign up. I, we don't have a form yet because it's very preliminary at this moment. Um, I'd also like to remind uh, any 4A students um, that the ECE department uh, has a 4B course survey. Um, and they'd like you to fill it out so that they can uh, schedule the 4B courses. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thanks for setting this up.